Hi, and welcome to this presentation about learning science and ways to apply learning science to physical therapy education. So today I want to talk about tips for improving the effectiveness of physical therapy education techniques couched within the science of learning. So evidence-based education principles that we can apply to different physical therapy settings. And my name is Lita McDaniel. Um, I'm a physical therapist in Atlanta, Georgia, and an adjunct professor at Emory University in the physical therapy division. So learning objectives for this presentation are to be able to identify and demonstrate effective teaching principles, again, drawn directly from the science of learning, learning science research. And I wanna talk about learning by teaching, retrieval practice, interleaving, the use of memory aids such as mnemonics and spacing. So for you to be able to identify these different techniques and start to integrate them into your teaching planning. So as part of this presentation, I want you all to gain some practice in applying each of these principles. This introduction, introductory presentation, we will go through the principles. And then in part two, I will kind of guide you through ways to apply some of these principles. And then the third learning objective would be for you to uh, gain some experience using teaching techniques or creating teaching techniques that could improve student learning, utilizing these learning science principles and building them out into a little bit larger exercises such as case studies, role plays, integrating and using memory aids, and then helping you, guiding you to design some of these teaching to learn type activities that you can start to use within your classes and within your curriculum. So the flow for today, as I mentioned in part one, it's gonna be an introduction to these learning science principles. I'm gonna present a little bit of the research that props up these principles and provide some evidence base, but I'm not gonna go into it in depth because what I really wanna focus on is the applications, but I do wanna give you a little bit of a background and start to introduce some of these principles that you'll be using within the applications part. Second part of the presentation is going to be some examples of how I will apply these principles within different physical therapy educational settings. So at different levels within a doctorate of physical therapy program, for example, for first year DPT students, your applications are gonna be a little bit different than for second year students or third year students. So remembering your audience and how you're crafting these teaching experiences and, um, or learning experiences through your teaching exercises. Um, furthermore, if you have the ability to and the opportunity to teach within a clinical setting, um, some of your applications are gonna be slightly different and tailored to that setting, as well as for the audience of post-professional education, and residency um, level education for physical therapy residency. Uh, I'm gonna give a few examples of that just as I teach within Emory's orthopedic residency program or I contribute to that program and kind of thinking about how we're gonna challenge higher level learners within the, the continuum of physical therapy education. And then, as I mentioned, uh, I will challenge you all and you'll get some practice creating these learning experiences. So I talked a little bit about who I am. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but I'm a physical therapist. Um, I did my orthopedic residency at Emory. I did my doctorate at Ohio University and went on to obtain my board specialty in orthopedics. Um, very interested in pain science and also learning science as applied to physical therapy education. So I did obtain a therapeutic pain specialist certification from Evidence in Motion um, and collaborate uh, quite closely with an educational psychologist, Dr. Mark McDaniel, who is the author of Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning, or co-author, um, I should say, and he also happens to be my father. So we have, within the last four or five years, started to collaborate and integrate our different research and academic interests such that we have uh, a co-publication within the Journal of Humanities and Rehabilitation, and that's kind of cited here, where we talk about applying the science of successful learning in physical therapy settings. Um, this book cover is, again, what I mentioned. He's the co-author of this book and hundreds of research articles, but the book is really where those findings have been extended to the general public to make them more accessible. 
um, from his laboratory on different findings within educational psychology and what is most effective. So I'd, I'd recommend that book if you want to learn more. Um, we were invited last summer. It was really quite a treat to be the keynote speakers at the 2022 Acute Care Physical Therapy Bridge the Gap Conference. And we spoke on some of these principles as applied within an acute care setting. So as a little bit of a stretch for me as an orthopedic physical therapist coming up with those examples, but that was quite fun. And then um, another one of our collaborations, and we have we have others beyond this, but this is kind of just to give you a taste, uh, was we were on, we were interviewed on the Healthcare Education and Transformation podcast. Um, and I put links to that in the in the uh, PowerPoint notes, so you can access that podcast interview if you would like to. Okay, so getting into some of these learning science principles. The way I like to teach this is I've come up with this mnemonic, which hopefully will help you learn and retain these learning science principles. And we know that mnemonics tend to help with learning. So mnemonic is kind of a memory tip, or sorry, a memory trick to help learning stick. And the mnemonic that I've come up with is gains. So how do we enhance learning? We want students to make gains. So G-A-I-N-S. So the first principle that I want to talk about out of these five is generate understanding. Um, and we'll kind of go through in order, but these are really the five key principles that I want to discuss, and then we're going to apply later on. So generate understanding is the first one. That's the G of gains. Active retrieval is the second. Interleaving is the third. Mnemonics is the fourth, spacing is the fifth. You'll notice I've taken some creative flexibility with the spelling of mnemonics. And you're saying, ah, it starts with an M, but that doesn't fit my mnemonic. So uh, humor me, but that's that's the better way to remember it is with this acronym. And so maybe it's humorous, but that should facilitate learning and it fits with the, with the acronym of GAINS. So here we go. What does this mean? So teaching or designing learning experiences where students or learners are tasked to come up with some sort of framework or schema to plug that knowledge into is really the challenge here. So we want to generate an understanding of concepts and background information that, that new learners can plug in novel information to. And that really, we've shown, helps with retention of information. So within generating understanding, how do we create these opportunities for students to have a deeper understanding of the novel knowledge that we're trying to present to them? Um, how do we create this? Two examples for you. The first one to try to help new learners generate understanding for principles and concepts and not just memorizing is to have them teach or prepare to teach. The second one is to have them generate whys or explanations for doing something a certain way or for two seemingly unrelated pieces of information connecting to each other. And so making those connections or generating the whys helps to facilitate remembering as well as teaching or preparing to teach. So we'll talk about each of those in turn. First way to help generate a deeper understanding for material is have a student teach about the material that they're learning. And it might seem a little bit of a push for an individual who is first learning some of this sometimes overwhelming amount of physical therapy foundational or background knowledge, for example, a first year physical therapy student, um, for them to be asked to teach the information that they're learning seems a bit counterintuitive and, and overwhelming. They don't have mastery yet. However, the act of even just preparing to teach, and that's what some of these research citations show, actually facilitates remembering for that information. So even in the absence of actually engaging in the teaching practice, preparing to teach and trying to conceptualize how you're going to explain this information to another individual, whether in a formal setting or to somebody who is a relative, a friend, a physical therapy classmate can be quite powerful in driving long-term retention and integrating a deeper level understanding of the information that we are trying to um, get these individuals to really own as we're teaching within our clinical doctorate degree. This is not a research degree. We want them to have the skills to be entry-level physical therapists 
exiting from our doctorate of physical therapy program. So having them own the information, I'll challenge my students in the classroom and say, this, we're not asking you to memorize this information just arbitrarily. We want you to learn this information so that you, when you get out into your clinical practice, you own that information, you know, that anatomy so that you can use it within your testing. You can explain it to your patients. And so having them create some agency and some ownership of the knowledge that we're gaining, I think can really be helpful. And part of that is engaging in these teaching exercises with students. So we'll have some more examples of that uh, in part two. This, this challenge for students to integrate teaching into their learning experience really aligns well with the medical training adage or medical training model of see one, do one, teach one. So observing a skill, performing a skill with feedback, and then teaching the skill. So it's a it's a medical model and it's partly a residency based medical model where you have a succession of uh, medical schooling at different stages with feedback, with mentorship. But really I hope, and I gained a lot from residency. I really hope that physical therapy may be moving in that direction where we are increasing the amount of mentorship for new physical therapy graduates and moving towards just a greater level of understanding and educational background so that we can really become specialists and own our place as autonomous providers within the medical, the greater medical community. So giving students opportunity, going back to these learning science principles, that is a little bit of a soapbox, I apologize, giving students the opportunity to teach at these different stages in their learning experience can be really quite helpful as they seek to consolidate that knowledge and kind of own that knowledge for their own practice. Second principle that I wanna talk about in this learning science principle of generating understanding, promoting con connections and a deeper understanding of the knowledge that we're trying to communicate is to generate whys. This is an experiment that comes from the learning science research that really shows how expecting or, or asking a learner to generate whys or reasons for something being the way it is or a certain condition can help understanding of those underlying principles. So this experiment was done with individuals who were novice chess players. So they didn't have much experience with the game at all. And they were taught the principles of chess. And then they were taught and observed these end games where a king and rook was, was left against a king and they saw different end games play out. So there were different groups within this experiment, the observation group, a prediction group, and then the prediction and explanation group, which I want you to key in on. So the explanation group is the one that was generating whys. They were generating explanations. So observation group was just observing these move, the end games. Prediction group was observing and they were kind of hypothesizing what's going to come next, what's going to come next uh, as they learned these chess principles. And then the final group was not only observing and predicting, but they were explaining here's what I think is going to happen next. And here's why. And remember, these are individuals who didn't know the game of chess that well. So their predictions were, you know, they were doing their best to come up with rational and realistic predictions, but they didn't necessarily have the full lexicon and the full experience of chess knowledge to come up with the best prediction. But they were, they were tasked to come up with some sort of prediction and connect what they were seeing with what they were hypothesizing for the future. Here's what we found. So the, sorry, the, so the test of knowledge, I should, I should tell you before I tell you the results. So the test of knowledge then was students playing out novel end games and also having, having to recall chess principles. So they were given like a written test of principles of chess. What are, what are the principles and how do those work? And then they were tasked with playing out these end games. So here's what we find is as expected, and I kind of front loaded this, the group that was that was um, tasked with explaining what was going to happen was much better at actually executing a checkmate. So out of five different opportunities, they were successful in three. 
versus the other two groups were only successful in one. So that's quite a bit of a difference in application of knowledge, which is great. And then the lower level, just retrieval of the underlying principles, they were better at as well. So they came up with a 60% accuracy in recalling chess principles. And then uh, that was compared with about 50% of the other two groups. So as you can see, not just learning the information, but being tasked with a deeper level cognitive process of trying to rationalize or trying to explain why something happens is quite successful in improving learning. And we can apply that within a physical therapy setting as well. So we'll get into that. Okay. The next principle I want to talk about is active retrieval. So we want to try to enhance the opportunities for students to have retrieval practice versus just looking at something, rereading, saying, hey, yep, that looks familiar. I know that where they're seeing something and that familiarity it oftentimes creates a false sense of fluency and remembering versus if a student is given a blank sheet of paper, for example, or fill in the blank type questions or case study type applications, and they're asked to retrieve that information, not only is a more accurate assessment of knowledge, but it tends to drive long-term retention better than just a matching type situation or passively looking at information. We know rereading is quite ineffective as a study technique. So in our physical therapy educational settings, we are trying to, and other educational settings, as the learning science demonstrates this over and over and over, rereading as a study technique is quite ineffective. So we are trying to get students to move away from that as much as possible and engage in these active learning processes. And some of these processes that are most effective are those that promote active retrieval practice. So one thing that emphasizes this is what's been termed the testing effect. So taking a test, independent of its assessment of knowledge, taking a test as a study activity actually improves long-term retention more than spending the same amount of time rereading or reviewing information. So as you think about your students in preparing for tests that they have in your class or the ultimate test that we think we're preparing them for, right? Which is the MPT board exam. What we want students to do is we want them to replicate those testing position, testing um, experiences or testing, testing uh, just the test itself. So the testing demands. And we see this within MPT, successful MPT board prep classes where what's a common board prep activity? It's taking practice tests. Why don't we utilize that within the rest of our physical therapy education? So the point of the practice test, again, is, is twofold. Um, maybe the highest one to be to promote long-term retention. The second one is to gauge preparedness or gauge knowledge. So taking a practice test, practice board exam, really highlights areas that of weakness or maybe misunderstanding for students so that they can go back and study those things. Well, that can be a really effective technique within your physical therapy courses and it can promote long-term retention. So if you see a question on a practice exam and you get it wrong and then you go back and learn, hey, why did I get that wrong? The retention for that information uh, tends to be improved um, because you're you're consolidating that information in a way that you were asked to retrieve it, regardless of your immediate performance effect, whether you get it wrong, whether you get it right, the fact that you're having to practice retrieving that information really enhances long-term retention and learning. So can't overstate that enough. Uh, the keys to creating active retrieval practice that's effective are that we want students to engage in many repetitions of retrieval. So this can look like a number of learning activities. And we'll go through some physical therapy specific examples beyond just the board prep um, and practice exam example that I just gave. We want students to have a lot, a lot, a lot of practice with retrieving information and using it versus just looking at it or rereading. We want the environments for these active retrieval practice sessions practice quizzes, practice tests to be low stakes. So we don't want the 
learning activity or the retrieval practice to be overly um, high stakes or overly anxiety producing. Uh, that's not to say that you aren't going to have these summative or cumulative exams, but those are more assessments of knowledge, even though they, they tend to promote learning as well. But those those you can think of as assessments of knowledge, like the final assessment, for example, the board exam itself. However, the retrieval practice leading up to that summative extensive summative assessment should be very low stakes. So participation points are fine, uh, but it should be a very small percentage if it is graded. Even ungraded retrieval practice is quite effective. Students want to do well. They're in graduate school in a physical therapy setting, and so they want to do well. They are achievement oriented, and th that is usually enough um, reinforcement for them to study. If they know that that, uh, that retrieval practice is going to be there, that's enough. You don't need to add, and in fact, it's counterproductive to attach a high grade or high stakes to that experience because you're not then you're not really utilizing it as effectively as you could as a learning experience. Then it becomes more punitive and becomes more of a, an assessment of knowledge. And again, as I said, kind of anxiety producing and you're, you're not really getting out what you want to because in this retrieval practice, in these environments, what we want to emphasize is we want to emphasize the retrieval itself. We don't want to emphasize getting something right or wrong. It's all about the practice and then having feedback from that retrieval was this, did I understand this correctly? Did I not? And if I didn't, then I want to know why. Not so much, did you get it right or did you get it wrong? Okay. The other thing we want to think about is we want to practice retrieval in different modalities. So we want some of that retrieval to be written, some of it to be verbal. Drawing can be a great, great thing to do, especially with anatomy, anatomy of nerves, anatomy of muscles. Drawing and having to conceptualize some of this information in three dimensions or two dimensional drawing is, is quite effective. And the more modalities that we utilize, the more senses that we utilize, the more effective learning is. So it's kind of a mis, um, misunderstanding that individuals have learning styles that we need to match to. Everybody learns in multiple senses and we wanna maximize retention. We can really use each of those senses because we get deeper encoding. So we'll kind of go into that a little bit um, in one of the future future principles as well. And then skill demonstration. So we can have students, and this kind of goes back to teaching as a learning exercise. We can have students demonstrate skills to other classmates. We can have students demonstrate skills within a low stakes practical environment. And that physical demonstration of the skills is quite powerful as a, as a teaching technique and as a learning technique. Okay, so the next few principles that I have go a little bit quicker because there is, um, there's definitely evidence based behind them, but they don't have as many kind of um, nuances that I'll present as the first few. So thanks for, thanks for sticking with me on these. The next learning science principle is this principle of interleaving, where we want to mix in different types of content within either a single learning session or across a class uh, semester or curriculum versus massing practice. So what I mean by this is within your different classes, you may have different amounts of control in your curriculum design in your class. However, as I'll mention in the application section, within an orthopedic case presentation, uh, for example, or case study, Patients are not only an orthopedic patient. So somebody who comes in an outpatient orthopedic clinic is still going to have comorbidities and potentially the need for taking vitals, potentially the need for doing a neurologic exam. So integrating some of those principles from prior classwork or other classes into that primary, primarily orthopedic patient case presentation can be quite powerful as a teaching um, manipulation and as a learning experience so that students are tasked with coming up with values for normal vital signs within an outpatient orthopedic setting 
that's how they're going to have to practice. They're not going to only see orthopedic impairments in the absence, like somebody's going to be totally healthy and all they're going to come in with is dorsal flexion limitation and range of motion, an acute ankle sprain, for example, and pain with MMTs. Well, they're not going to have any other comorbidities. That's quite unrealistic. So let's utilize those things and interleave different types of information in a single learning session. So where does this come from? Well, here's an experiment that was performed in the laboratory that really demonstrates the importance and the power of interleaving as a learning technique and a, and a teaching technique. This comes from a math classroom where students were in one of two conditions. So they were learning. It was... Um, a geometry class. And what they were doing is they were learning how to compute volumes of different types of solids. So as you can see in that figure, they were computing volume of a sphere, the volume of a cone, the volume of a cylinder, um, an ellipse. And certain students engaged in blocked practice where they were doing problem sets on only spheres. Sphere, 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 computing volumes. And then they would switch and they would go to cone, 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 computing uh, or doing practice equations, doing practice problems. The other group that they had was a group where they had in instruction on all the different solids and they were mixing practice. So in other words, maybe problem number one, they had to compute the volume of the sphere. Problem number two, cylinder. Problem number three, a cone and so on and so forth. So they they had a little bit harder of a challenge within these problem sets. Uh, and they struggled a little bit more because they had to switch between different equations, different types of solids. And so what we found between these two conditions on a, so then they had a final test on eight problems that they had never seen a week after they had these different, these different types of practice. And here's what we found. So first, what I want you to look at and just kind of ignore the graph on the right I want you to look at the graph on the left, and this is the this is the practice. This is when they were doing these practice sets. And what you'll see is, so the mixers, those are the ones who were interleaving. So the mixers did quite, you know, they didn't do awesome on their practice, their practice problems. They got about 60% right because they were doing, and they had to do a sphere, and then, oh my goodness, they had to remember the formula for a cylinder and then a cone and they kind of struggled. They only got 60% correct. Whereas the blockers, the ones that were doing sphere, 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 before they switched to the different, did quite well. You know, 90% correct. And they were just feeling on top of the world, like, hey, I'm learning this, this is fantastic. Well, what did we see a week later? So now looking at the graph on the right, what you can see as the blockers, the ones that were doing sphere, 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 sphere practice, and then switching, are tanking. Their long-term retention or their learning is just not there because they were given this artificial condition of only having one type of problem at a time and they didn't really learn as well as the as the mixers did. So you can see the blockers, the ones that had one type of problem at once and then switch, now they're only getting 20% correct. And this is only a week apart. The mixers, on the other hand, they're still only getting 60% correct, but they've learned everything, every amount of knowledge that they worked hard for in those problem sets, they're retaining. So you can view it like that. And I'd like you to view it like that because this hits at a really key principle in learning science and especially in interleaving is it's much harder to practice in this way. But that effort and that struggle is what helps drive long-term retention. So we want to reinforce, sorry, we want to reinforce the idea that those practice conditions, they may be more effortful, but they're going to pay off in the long term. So that's really the power of interleaving. Okay, moving on to the next technique. This is where mnemonics and memory trip, memory tips, sorry about that, really come into key. So instead of viewing these as cheating or like a crutch, these can actually be leveraged to drive long-term retention. So, sorry, let me go back. Let me go back one. So within mnemonics, and this is why I don't have a lot in here, within mnemonics, um, I really want to get into this when we start talking about the physical therapy examples, but what I will leave you with is 
One example that was utilized within the research, and I'm sorry, I took the took the slide out for brevity, but this was an example with multi-sensory encoding. And what we found was that individuals were learning um, different motoric actions. So for example, comb your hair, tie your, or comb your hair, tie your shoe, open the door. So a verb and then a very simple outcome or a very simple sentence. And what we found is that individuals who are just trying to memorize the sentence itself, so comb your hair, tie your shoe, did not have as good long-term retention as those individuals who were tasked with actually acting out the sentence. So they saw comb your hair and they went through the process of actually doing the combing. This is a great analog to how we can train within physical therapy, making things physically demanding as far as not 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 effort based not like lifting super heavy weights physically demanding but physically demanding in other words if an individual is learning a technique and we do this pretty well within a physical therapy setting making the majority of our learning lab based or execution based so learn a technique practice it learn a technique practice it the more hands on repetitions and the more practice of these different skills and the more senses that we can incorporate into the learning experience, the better retention will be. So that's what I mean when I say multi-sensory recovery. Spacing is the last principle that I want to talk about. And this refers to the idea that we want to space practice over time. So this gets at the common understanding that you don't want to cram for a test. You want to space out your studying before the test. You don't want to just put all your studying on the night before. And this is pretty straightforward as far as it goes, but we do want to emphasize a little bits of practice over time, and we can incorporate that in our classroom settings. So I'll give you some ideas of that. One example that comes from a medical experiment on the power of spacing was actually done within surgical residents. And I would like to present this because it really gets at how important this is for um, physical and practical skill acquisition, which is what we think of within our doctorate of physical therapy, our practical doctorate. So what they did with these surgical residents is they had one group who did training on, and they were, they were being trained on microvascular surgery. Um, so they were using an artery model, synthetic artery model, and they were trained on this type of surgery and half the residents were trained and they had all their training sessions in a single day. And then the other half of the residents had their training sessions spaced out over four weeks and they had one each week. So what do we find with the training? And then what do we find with the test? So a month later, what we find is that those who spaced out their practice, they had better retention for the principles for these microsurgical drills and the techniques for the microvascular surgery. So great, you space out your practice, you have better retention for the principles. It's pretty intuitive. So don't cram. Don't cram all your studying into one day. Even if you're learning microsurgical drills, um, we want to space it out. The thing that's very powerful is, and I think you will, you will kind of find this, is that they were also asked to do a transfer task where they were asked to do perform the actual, an actual microvascular surgery, which is an anastomosis surgery, an aortic anastomosis on a rat. So they're now asked to do the physical surgery instead of just recalling the, the technique of doing the surgery. What do we find? Well, the half of the residents that did all their practice sessions in one day, about a little over 15% of those residents failed the surgery. So their rat died. Bummer. I don't necessarily want that resident performing surgery on me. That's risky. We don't want to kill over 15% of our patients, even if it's, you know, fake rat, not fake, but non-human animal patients. That's not great. We, we want that error rate to go down quite significantly. What do we see with the group that spaced out their practice? Well, you can see this bar over on the right and you would say, well, even that space group had some error. No, they actually didn't. Out of that spaced group, the only reason I have this little bar in here is to show you that I didn't forget to put that bar in. The spaced group had no surgical failures on their rats. So 
you know, this isn't, this isn't to say you're going to have a perfect um, cohesion of knowledge if you utilize spacing, but the error rate was quite a bit different between the residents who were asked to perform the surgical practice in a spaced manner versus all at one time. So we want to really utilize that in our teaching and training. Okay, so some key take-home points. I know that was a lot all at once. We'll have some opportunity to practice each of those uh, each of these techniques within some of these physical therapy settings and applications in part two, but some take-home points from part one, the principles, the effective learning strategies that I want you to remember, follow this acronym GAINS. So here are the keys. We want students to have opportunities to generate connections, whether it's teaching or explaining whys behind the information they're learning. Quiz, quiz, quiz. So I can't emphasize this enough. We want a lot of repetitions of active retrieval where they're being forced to recall that information. We wanna utilize interleaving. So the example that I gave was the orthopedic patient. We wanna have them with our case examples. We're taking vitals, we're integrating knowledge of comorbidities, screening for red flags. Potentially they have a neurologic dysfunction. So we're using information from other classes and other body systems. Mnemonics, these can help. So using memory tips and mnemonics, um, I didn't mention this, but within asking students to learn anatomical knowledge, you can use some of these mnemonics, for example, for the brachial plexus, for um, different arteries and things like that. Those mnemonics can really help for cranial nerves. Uh, they can help students learn and it's not a crutch. It's not something negative. They can help with memory. The other thing we want to utilize is multi senses. So, multi sensory encoding can help with knowledge acquisition. And finally, we want to remember to space out practice and space out um, presentation and practice with material over time. So, not cramming it all into one study session, one lecture session. Uh, really spacing out the practice can help with long term retention. Remembering, though, that space practice is a little bit harder. So putting it all at once was going to make the learner feel better because their short-term performance, uh, especially as we saw in that math math problem, so that that gets into interleaving a little bit. But you know we want we want temporal breaks between our study sessions, but we also want to mix in diverse types of information. The thing that we really need to emphasize with students is buy into this sort of learning strategy as students and as instructors, because for both audiences, for both perspectives, for the learner and for the instructor, it's going to feel harder because of that effort. It's going to feel harder to interleave different types of information. It's going to feel harder to study one principle and then a week later come back to it before you studied it again versus putting all your study session one day at the end of that study session, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I've learned so much. Not true. In the short term, it's going to feel better, but your long-term retention is not going to be as good. So I just want to emphasize that. One thing that I really like is this research on growth mindset, because I think it emphasizes effort and really tries to get some buy-in on the idea that, um, your practice sessions are going to be effortful. They're going to feel hard, but that's part of the process. So for our students within these learning contexts, we really want to praise effort versus short-term performance. And that comes back to the low stakes idea of quizzing, testing, things like that. We want to view these mistakes, these little mistakes in the short term as opportunities for learning. So celebrate those little mistakes. Oh my gosh, you messed up now? That's great. That's an opportunity to learn this so that in the future, you're going to remember this piece of information. And we want to keep the focus on the long-term goal. So you do little mess ups along the way, but that long-term outcome is going to be quite superior versus not making any mistakes in the short term. You don't have a good sense of what you know, and your long-term performance is going to suffer. So really emphasizing for our students that we want to be, we're not trying to be hard on you, but we want to be demanding as far as your knowledge acquisition in the short term so that your skill as a physical therapist is up to par when we when we graduate you as an entry level provider. We want to prepare you for the board exam versus having you be perfect on your performance now. We want you to be good and we want you to pass your boards. So hopefully that that leaves you with a good sense for some of these learning science principles, a little bit of foreshadowing of how we're going to apply them 
And we'll get into that a lot more in part two. So questions, I know we're not doing this in real time, but I would love to hear from you if you do have questions, comments. This is my contact information. Um, I am very passionate about teaching and applying applying the science of learning. So please get in touch if you if you want to, if you have any questions or feedback for me. And these are my references.